I don't know whether you tuned in yesterday, Michael, and, and saw some of, of David Tepper's comments, but I guess it's, it, he kept saying it is what it is, and it is what it is. So the interest rates are headed higher. That hurts multiples, slows down the economy, which could impact earnings. So it's just not an ideal situation. Uh, is there anything that we're missing in terms of maybe the, the second derivative, that things in certain areas are improving so we can see light at the end of the tunnel that's not an approaching freight train, Michael? Yeah, I, I did see a lot of what David said yesterday. And I think there, there are some highlights or some spots in the market I think you could be selective in. But I'm in the camp. We've been, we've been fairly negative for, for most of the year, um, specifically in areas like tech and discretionary, I think where there's no visibility on earnings. Um, those are tough places. But staples and healthcare, I think you can selectively jump in there and, and look for some spots that are going to hold up where the consumer is not going to be stretched either. Uh, I think there's some consumer areas that, you know, super high credit card debt, super low cash balances, that's a problem going forward. So I think um, we're cautious probably for the next six months. Michael, is, is the consumer still solid, though? Does the Fed look at the consumer and say we have more work to do? Or are there signs of... of of the consumer cracking? I see the consumer cracking. I, like I mentioned, the high levels of debt, the low levels of cash balances. Just saw data that 24% um, year-over-year increase in 401k hardship loan withdrawals. That's not a strong consumer. I'm not saying the consumer's not spending a lot. That's different than the consumer being strong. Uh, we all have a tendency this time of the year to spend more than we should. And then in January, we realized we shouldn't have done that. But I think the consumer, to some extent, is, is cracking, overextended. And certainly with home prices coming down, where are you going to get the money? It's not 401k loans. You're starting to tap those. Home equity loans, you're not going to be able to get any money out of your house. So there's, there's a concern here for consumer discretionary type names that aren't what you need. It's what you want. Right. Ross, 40 years. 40 years we had you know low inflation, uh, basically. And we had you know some pretty friendly... Uh, monetary policies, at least for the last 15. So things are different. Should we just, should we just accept that? And I mean, with stocks, if you're looking for five to 6% annualized, if you can get four and a third tax, or not tax free, but uh, risk free for two years in a two year, don't, should we just say, let's just chuck it. Let's just go ahead and, and just go into, uh, let's go into these notes and, and just not, not worry about the stock market. Should people be doing that? I wouldn't say people should not worry about the stock market altogether, but I do think there's something to what you're saying, which is that for the first time in a while, there's real competition for capital, whether that's uh, in fixed income where you can get some some really good yield on high quality credit, whether it's treasuries or, or you know in the in the high quality corporate, um, or even something like commodities, which have obviously sold off of late, but. Uh, to the extent that some of those markets are structurally tight on the supply side. Um, you know, just just another asset class that has really come into favor over the last 18 months that could provide competition for capital. And if inflation proves sticky, even if it's at, say, three or four percent long term, say that the supply shortage in the labor market keeps inflation a little bit higher than the Fed wants. Maybe that keeps the rates a little bit higher than we're used to. And I think that it, it represents a real regime shift from what last decade was to what the next decade could be, or at least in the near term. So we don't need uh Latin America or Zimbabwe type inflation to to where it has an effect on financial assets. So even three or four percent if it's sustained. And I guess I could see that with if the labor market really is, uh, you know, different than what we're used to. And there's a lot of reasons to think maybe maybe it is. It, so if it sticks in the labor market at three or four percent, that might be enough to keep the Fed tightening for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to any of the the FOMC you know committee, or if you listen to Fed Chair Powell, they're laser focused on this labor market imbalance right now. And there are some estimates that the labor uh, supply is short four or five million workers from pre-pandemic trends. Um, you know, it's some combination of early retirements, people stand on the sideline for COVID, lack of immigration. You know, whatever it is, we're short millions of workers. And that results in, you know, wage growth that's incompatible with their 2% inflation target. They know that, and they're not going to change their 2% inflation target because that represents a real credibility issue. So to the extent that this is a problem for, for years, that it's a multi-year problem and not a month problem, um, I think you could see inflation, you know, as opposed to on the low side of 2%, under 2%, 
um, above 2%. And, and that represents, you know, a totally different regime. Rates probably yeah. prove a little stickier uh, and higher than they've been for the last decade. And that, that changes the, the total, you know, investment landscape, uh, value over growth, competition for capital, fixed income versus equity. And so you just kind of have to get used to a new environment, I think. Yeah. 